Call of Duty Zombies. Now I'm gonna take a guess here and say you probably thought of a Black Ops 1 map, right? And I don't blame you. It was a staple of the COD Zombies franchise and looking back on it made me realise that it really felt like a World at War 2.0. Just not about a world being at war. No, what I mean is World at War Zombies Plus. When Treyarch could flex those bulging creative muscles due to the success of the previous Zombies mode, carrying over the same style and gameplay but improving it in certain aspects. But one thing that is very very apparent Treyarch took over with them from World at War to Black Ops 1 Zombies was its horror. Zombies in the first Black Ops definitely had a way of getting under my skin, and although I was younger when I played it, I think a lot of these feelings can still be felt now to a certain degree, and were felt for several reasons, much like when we crashed in the middle of a field, went to an asylum, were stranded in a swamp in Japan, and wound up at a Nazi facility where this whole mess happened. I made a video talking about how scary World at War Zombies really was, and I had no doubt in my mind that at some point I'd be talking about the chilling experience that is Black Ops 1's third game mode. And that time is now. If you haven't watched the World at War video, I strongly recommend you do. As that video is going to give you a lot more context to this one, I've put it on an iCard here for you and I'll link it in the description as well. And watching the World at War video and then this one is going to make it feel a bit more cohesive, but I digress. Join me as we take a look at the horrors of Black Ops 1 zombies. Okay, I know this seems weird, but I wanted to start off with the main menu. The main menu of Black Ops 1 is one of the best I've ever seen. As far as the campaign goes, it fits the cryptic theme of that perfectly. You, Mason the player, are strapped to a chair in a mysterious room and have the silhouette of an interrogator who you can't see behind a glass window. He's looking down at you asking what the numbers mean, whilst you're hooked up to an electric machine that's gonna shock you. There are TVs playing more campaign related things about JFK and Vietnam, etc. However, the main menu takes a darker turn and manages to match the mystery that the campaign brings when you select zombies. The colour of the room changes to a thick red, and the interrogator walks away, out of his office. The TVs are now displaying footage of grotesque zombies, decaying bodies, and experimentation footage. Whilst you're absorbing all of that and thinking about what the hell you're looking at, what's interesting though is when you look up at the window and see the interrogator come back. Well, it's safe to say he won't be asking you questions anymore. Yes, our boy has been turned into a hungry, ravaging zombie and is slamming his cold hands on the window to try and reach you, who is completely bound in that chair. This ran a chill down my spine when I first saw this. In fact, it still does sometimes. When you look back at the TVs and you're seeing all of this, what honestly looks like found footage sometimes, feels as though it's making you witness what you're actually in for when you load up a map, which I think is genius. The silhouette of the zombie at the window is still persistent on reaching you and the thuds of the window echo through the room, all whilst being accompanied by the absolute slapper of a song that is Damned by Brian Dewey, adding that creepy yet intrigued feeling this game and the zombies mode before it brings to the table. All of these elements come together and a hopelessness dawns on you. And this is just the main menu. This room is freaking me out now and I can see some cracks through that window, so let's get out of here and take a look at our first map. Starting off with one of the scarier maps here, Kino de Toten, translated to Theater of the Dead from German, was once a believe it or not theater in Berlin during the 1960s. It was once a place people used to gather together and enjoy something, but we visit this map when it's been taken over by Group 935 and overrun with our all too familiar undead mates. Upon spawning in, you can immediately tell that this place has seen better days. <laughs> wait, 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 there's something I need to do first. Freaking kidding me? No power!
I mean, it certainly would have. Theatres like these were filled with rich patterns, diverse architecture, and regal, bright colours. But now, it isn't the jaw-dropping place it used to be. The rich patterns have started to scuff and fade away, the diverse architecture is falling to bits. Hell, some sections have fully been destroyed and those regal, bright colours are now drab and decaying. The Nazi flags all around this map are a stark reminder that, even though there's no alive Nazis in the area, their horrific impact from the things they were doing here is still a heavy weight that you can't ignore, no matter how hard you might try. Oh yeah, there's blood everywhere too. The place literally is falling to pieces when the power is turned on and makes a loud thud as it collapses. It's safe to say Kino de Toten already sets the scene to be a place long past its prime and turn into something much more sinister and bleak. And we're about to go deeper to find whatever long abandoned secrets and scares are lying in here. So, this is a zombies game, and it's no surprise that much like World at War, they're coming from the barriers again. You can see into other parts of the theatre through these barriers that have been completely obliterated, and it really makes you feel like you're being buried in all of this rubble. Out of all of the barriers in this map, there is one that stood out to me that used to give me the heebie-jeebies though. It was none other than the infamous Void Barrier, as I'm calling it now. The Void Barrier, for those who don't know, is in the spawn room and if you look into it, it is just complete darkness. No furniture, objects, or anything, really. It's pretty ominous looking, to say the least, and I never will know if this is an intentional thing that the developers added, or if this was some sort of lighting glitch that never managed to get patched. I can't lie, it used to freak me out a little when I was younger, and it's one of those strange details that adds a spooky charm to this map in particular. I can't tell you exactly why it freaked me out, it just was one of those things where it's very unknown and it feels so out of place. Why can we not see anything? What is hiding behind there? I'm sure it is just a lighting bug that was never patched, but it does feel like you are staring into an endless void nonetheless. Let's be honest, going to this place is probably a one-way ticket to the back rooms, so maybe stay out of that barrier. I always used to wonder what was past the barriers and around the map where we can't see and staring into some barriers and thinking about the horrors down there it used to give me the chills. When you're going through the motions of a zombies march, you've turned on the power, you'll notice that when you're being teleported to pack a punch, you can see a projector since you go to the projector room. And if you have some reels, it can actually be interacted with to be able to put them in and play them on the actual theatre screen. It could play a variety of things, such as a horde of zombies, or even an eye staring right at you. It makes you feel very uneasy, although I would say that this is more of a back background scare, something that just adds a little bit of flavour to everything else around you. But even that background horror has a surprisingly good amount of depth to it, with this film reel that is the Horde of Zombies. Now not only is this a nightmare fuel, I think seeing this, especially when I was younger or if I'm like in a dark room now, has this weird effect on me where it makes me feel very uneasy. The black and white image, the constant flickering between different images, the fact that these are not in-game models, but it looks like a real photograph, and the way their hands are up in the air, it's as though they're like coming for you, they're trying to grab you, and of course, how could I forget? The eyes. The zombies' eyes are one of the most distinct features of Call of Duty Zombies, so much so that other games have copied it to this day. It gives them that scary supernatural feeling, and I couldn't imagine seeing those eyes on a person as they begin slowly shambling towards you. Now when I said that this looks looks like a real photo, that's because it is. Here's the zombies here, and here's the original image. The original image is actually of German soldiers surrendering, hence why they have their hands up in the air. There's something about the way Treyarch changed these photos, while staying weirdly true to these original ones, and of course the fact that they're real photos that makes this much, much darker. Taking a deeper look here, the place you get these reels used to freak me out and still kinda does. There are a variety of places you can get teleported to after leaving pack a bunch before heading back to spawn which include the conference room from 5, a dentist's office, and two versions of Samantha's room. One of these versions is just like a normal child's room, albeit there are some things that look off and gives a really uncomfortable vibe, such as the teddy bears and the monkey bomb on the bed. And then there's the other version of 
alpha room. If you get teleported into this room, you'll notice it looks much scarier than the other rooms. It has a thick red hue to it and there is blood everywhere. This room feels a lot more claustrophobic than the others. There's a big pile of bloody teddies. The place looks like an absolute state. And not to mention the teddy bear with the beaming red eye fixating on you. Also, this teddy bear looked a bit bigger than I would have liked. If you're in this place and you have a keen ear, you can actually hear Samantha weeping by the sounds of it, which really doesn't help with any of this stuff. And not to mention the ambience in this room. Granted, the ambience in the normal version of Samantha's room is pretty chilling, but this is on a different level. So ladies and gentlemen, we are about to do the brown pants speed run. I'm gonna play it for you now. I'm just glad that we're only in here for a very short amount of time, because the overall atmosphere is not comfortable to be in. Unlike World at War's maps taking place in desolate locations, isolated from everything else, Kina de Toten is actually in a city and you can see other buildings surrounding you. Going outside is a delightful experience in this map anyway. But congratulations, now that you're outside, you are one step closer to touching grass. Weirdly enough, the alleyway in Kino is by far one of the most treacherous parts of this map. Yeah, that's right, just because you're outside doesn't mean you're safe. This seems to indicate to the player that despite being outside in broad daylight, your situation isn't exactly getting any better or safer. Ironically, speedrunners would use this place as a training spot, but whatever. The buildings around the map when you go outside are as withered and decrepit as the theatre you're in. The whole environment feels like a ghost town, and with the zombies shambling around making creepy ass noises, that echo through the streets, hearing them come for you, it gives not just a feeling of dread, but makes you feel completely closed in and stranded in a place you shouldn't be in. Overall, it has that abandoned area vibe that you see people explore on YouTube, and I love it for that. Gazing into the streets of Kino gives off that GM construct kind of vibe, where you're walking around that place on your own and everything feels so incredibly off. And they both share that liminal space feel, very out of touch with reality and you feel like something's always watching you. It's quiet too quiet. Kino de Toten, much like World at War's Verrucht, has blood. Lots of blood. Something I've come to notice with the map that adds another further layer of horror and depth to the seemingly simple map are the bloodstains and how some of them end up telling a story. Bloodstains protruding from barriers, leading to places you can't quite see past, or coming into the map itself and seeing what we can only assume was once somebody's dying struggle, all before the zombies took over. You can see the desperation in in their attempt of escape and it's creepy as hell. This smeared handprint here on the wall is a great example. I mean look at this. There was clearly someone on the run here and they didn't quite make an escape. It really goes to show how menacing and savage these Nazi zombies really are. And there's so many examples of bloodstains like this around Kino de Toten. In fact, not even just Kino de Toten, like all of Black Ops 1 zombies. And with your mind filling in the blanks about these kinds of things, where the person is and what happens to them makes your brain spiral down this rabbit hole of deep, morbid thought. And whenever I see a game get you to think in that way, I can't help but admire it. There's these certain bloodstains that resemble a grim reaper. I know it's not just me that's noticed this, but I remember playing when I was younger and I would see it and I would think, that guy looks like this guy. But I have also seen comments saying that they've seen the same thing without me ever mentioning it. And I don't think I need to describe to you who the grim reaper is. But with bloodstains being in that shape, it looks really menacing and intimidating and it kind of made me feel like I was being watched in some way. And overall it just fits with the theme of undead people. The farting golems that you've seen around the map are known as Nova Crawlers. I'm not searching farting golem for an image for this because I feel like what I'll find there is going to be something that is scarier than anything I could show you in this video. The reason Nova's in their name is because they were made from Nova 6 that is seen in the campaign for this game. There's even some chalk scribbles on the wall at spawn literally warning you, although subtly, about these fiends. It reads, beware of the six, with the six being the Nova six 
Yeah, I think you get it. These crawlers were failed experiments made from pigs that contain the Nova 6 gas in them. When they're shot by the player, the gas explodes out of them, blurring the player's vision. Not being able to see in a map with such sharp turns and tight choke points that you'll need to run through is a great way to build suspense for the player. In fact, taking away any of the senses away from a player or any person engaging in horror media has always been a trick used, not because it's cheap, but because it's effective. These strange beings crawl over to you to enter the map via breaking the rooftops in certain areas, destroying the place even more to be able to come and get you. Their appearance is actually very unsettling. They have an extremely malnourished and slender figure. You can see how strange their bone structure looks and they have a pale skin colour, a huge gaping mouth with sharp teeth and no eyes or any other facial features. And how can we forget about their long, sharp claws? These strange imps move around on all fours, like four-legged spiders, and when you think about it that way and you see them moving like that, makes the hairs on you stand up a little bit. It just looks so unnatural, but it wouldn't be that shocking if that's all they did. I feel bad for the unsuspecting player that managed to see them cling to a wall and start crawling down the sides of the map out of the holes in the roof where it collapsed, or where they broke in. So you've been teleported into this theatre, and from everything we've covered so far, it's safe to say it sure looks creepy, but what about how this map sounds? What, you really thought we would be in a ghost town, huddled up in an abandoned, decaying theatre that was turned into a Group 935 facility and then overrun with the zombies and it wouldn't have any eerie noises? <laughs> Kino's noises and ambience make this ghostly location feel like it's truly haunted and abandoned. On my second Call of Duty Zombies iceberg- wait, wait, this- isn't a plug, but check it out if you haven't already. I covered on that video an entry called Kino Ambience Anxiety Frequencies. This entry hit me so hard that I went back to the 9th of November 2010 because out of all the maps with creepy ambience, besides World at War Zombies maps, I always remember Kino's ambience noises being genuinely scary to hear, and much like the game's predecessor, it made me shit my pants. Seriously, listen to this ambience. The frequencies of these noises just trigger my fight or flight response in my lizard brain, and so with the already withered and ominous visuals of the map, these sounds infiltrating my ears is not pleasant. The creaks, the sparks of electricity, the thuds, all come together to complement the aesthetics of the map to make you feel suspense that something is near you or is about to happen to you, sending this minor feeling of disorientation in the sense that just as you're starting to doze off, starting to feel comfortable in this map, it throws one of these noises at you and that primal fear kicks in. It's like the COD zombies equivalent of the Minecraft cave noises. Even the humming in the perk machines in a near silent room shows how desolate this place is. But Kino de Toten can somehow make you feel like something is wrong. Like a dark secret hiding within everything you've already experienced so far, which is everything I've talked about. Despite it being a zombie breakout and on later rounds being cramped with zombies flooding through the theatre, there is no better example of this idea than the infamous dressing room. Now don't get me wrong, it is an already spooky looking room, but beyond the bounds of the map, through a barrier you can't see too far past, you can hear this when you approach it. Oh boy, this is really unsettling. Despite there being no visuals, we have hard, loud knocks, almost desperate in its delivery. Come to think of it, I think the dimly lit, tight room we can see where the knocking is coming from serves as a sort of set dressing for this little experience. The art of let your mind make the horror. When something isn't presented in some cases of horror media, books usually use this a lot and to great effect, our minds will always imagine 
imagine something much scarier than what could ever be shown via films or illustration. Have there been exceptions? Probably. Although they don't come to mind straight away, but with the dressing room knocking, this is exactly what we see, or here, I guess. It leads down to that line of thinking I mentioned earlier with the bloodstains, where you're thinking as to what it could be all about. Who is in there? What is in there? Why the knocking? Why there? It's something that we have no answer to and probably never will, leaving us only with our own conclusion. Another mystery that we have never got a concrete answer for in this strange theatre are the pods. No, not, not them. If you head over to the stage, you can find these pods sat around and at first they may just seem like props or some sort of storage until you go and take a look at what's inside of them. and it ends up being quite a shock, and much like the knock-in, I can't even wrap my head around what the hell this is even about. Why are they there? It's a detail that you can go years without even noticing, but it shows such a good level of attention to detail to this map. Treyarch throwing in little scares like these for you to find in the map is a detail that I love, and Kino is a shining example of just how creamy it is when these easter eggs are implemented. These zombies pods didn't have to be put in, but considering they are just sat there, gives the map quite Quite a foreboding aura, making you think deeper about this abandoned theatre. But hey, at least you found the last meteor. This has to be the last piece. I found the hidden song. Awesome. It's safe to say I love how rich some of the scares are in Kino de Toten. It makes me think, hey, you know what? This seems like it could be a World at War map. And that's exactly the case. World at War was supposed to have Kino as its fourth DLC map, but Activision said to Treyarch that this release was too close to Modern Warfare 2's and didn't want any attention being taken away from its release. And so it was saved for Black Ops 1 and the rest was history. This explains why the map is arguably one of the most horror-based zombies maps on this game or even out of every Call of Duty game. Oh, and I forgot to mention there are mannequins too in the dressing room. I still hate mannequins. Kino de Toten has that theme of hollowness and abandonment. The way the wind blows right through the building, seamlessly going through one hole in the wall and straight out the other, as if there's already nothing there to begin with. This place, the city around it, is well and truly dead. This map, if it wasn't made obvious already, seems to focus on a ghost town type of feel, like you're exploring an abandoned building you really shouldn't be in, with dark twisted secrets. It was once a place of joy and entertainment, and now it sits there, broken and bustling, with the undead as it decays, much like the corpses of those Nazi zombies. Five. A map that I- wait, 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 hold up. Why is it called five? Oh, because a pentagon has five sides, and, and the map is set at the- Ah, I'm not gonna lie though, I felt like the smartest kid ever when I figured that one out. Five is a map that, to me, feels like a haunted house. And that may sound strange because it's the Pentagon and maybe that title should go to another map like Kino, and whilst Kino certainly looks like a haunted house, the reason I say this about Five is that the flow of the map and overall structure makes me think that this bonus map plays like you are in a haunted house. You'll see what I mean as the video goes on. Five much like Kino de Toten, is claustrophobic as hell, but unlike other maps, it plays on the feeling that the walls are closing in on you, and that everything is getting tighter. Also, can we remember just how freaking cool that opening cutscene was? For time and the world do not stand still. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. I said, are certain to miss the future. <laughs> oh no, I missed that. We see JFK, Fidel Castro, Nixon, and McNamara all having a meeting about the Cuban Missile Crisis until they're rudely interrupted by the zombie horde. Sounds like someone breaking in. It's just a storm, dick. Sit down. The line JFK says at the end of the cutscene couldn't be more fitting for this map. Do not pray for easy lives, my friends. Pray to be stronger men. And a stronger man you will be after playing this map and witnessing its scares. So, let's start from the top here. Power level 
level critical. Major systems offline. You spawn into a conference room, and it's surprisingly tame, actually. A little eerie, sure, but nothing horror-filled right now. Much like the beginning of a haunted house. But let me tell you, it's only going to get worse from here. The spawn room honestly feels like you've just gone into the back rooms. I told you not to go into that void barrier. The only noises you really hear in this place are the clocks ticking and the beeping and booping of office equipment and telephones, and not to forget the faint but apparent humming of the office lights. Looking around, you'll notice that there are no barriers, instead there's just windows. Behind these windows, you start to see small blurry yellow lights emerging from the dark office rooms behind the glass, which you can't see too clearly through. You can then hear the groans of the flesh eaters getting louder and louder until until the glass has been broken and behind it the infamous zombies are here. How about we take a look at where these zombies are emerging from? The Out of Bounds areas in 5, much like Kino, made me feel uncomfortable. I remember getting lost in thought just staring at the stained and filthy office roof panels, rows upon rows of filing cabinets, empty seats, bland drab office walls, and all the washed out gross looking yellowy office carpets that you can see around this level of the pentagon. Going out of bounds and walking around and seeing these long stretches of empty, bland, lifeless offices really is a backroom's experience. It feels like you're in a completely different world and everything around you feels detached from reality as you know it. And the offices here would fit right at home with all the liminal spaces you see around the internet, much like the backrooms. These have so much depth to them and they honestly feel like an endless labyrinth of office blocks, with nothing but corpses and dimly lit lights for what looks and feels like miles. The haunted house experience has officially begun, although not too intense, especially considering it's early rounds anyway, and accounting for the fact that it's a little bit unsettling because of the abandoned office vibe that has that backrooms feel, it's bright, doesn't feel too claustrophobic, and is shaping up to be another standard zombies map for now. The next layer of this haunted house escapade is like when you've passed the entrance and are now making your way into the deeper part of the complex. You were a little creeped out and uncomfortable, sure, but this is where it stops feeling like you're in a controlled environment and you're now starting to become immersed in the chills. When taking the elevator down the pentagon, you enter the war room. The war room, where strategy and tactics were once discussed, is now empty, besides the undead visitors, which, by the way, you might want to keep an eye out for because because have you seen how dark it is in this room? Some parts of the war room are so dark that it feels like you can't even see them coming up to you. The only good tell that you have sometimes is their glowing eyes and I think that adds to this scare train. It taps into the classic fear of the darkness, the unknown. So seeing all these yellow lights illuminating in the darkness is pretty creepy and can help emphasize how many of them there actually are. You've probably also noticed that despite it being a bigger room than the spawn area Area in the offices is somehow more cramped. There's more clutter in the way and you keep running into things that you can't even see. And you quickly realise these rooms don't feel like they're designed for a fun time of zombies training. And clearly that's something deliberate on Treyarch's behalf. Once again, 5 takes you out of your comfort zone in not only a visual way, but also the way you play the game too, which is a core concept of the zombies mode, and slamming the brakes on it so you can only just to barely get by, but even then the skill gap is big. Have the walls always been this close? A thing about this map that always made my cheeks clench when I was younger and still makes them clench now is the placement of Juggernog. The most important perk in the entirety of anything ever and all of zombies is tucked away in a corner. Grabbing this perk has not only game ended just me, but so many zombies players in the past. Oh, 
In terms of placement for this perk, it's up there with the terrible jug location in Origins. And believe me, that is saying something. You are risking it all going for this perk, especially when all it takes is one or two zombies to corner you. This isn't Cold War or Black Ops 4, you don't have any of these field upgrades or elixirs or any kind of get out of jail free cards, so if you're gonna get jug, you gotta be quick. The zombies only have to swipe you a measly two times. It's painfully ironic, the perk that extends your amount of hits until a down is located in a position where that is likely to happen. Whoever did this, I hate you, but I also love you, but I hate you. Anyway, it's getting cramped in here and I keep running around into random fences and computers, so let's descend down into another layer of this hell, shall we? A new level of depth and darkness to this house of horrors begins. You aren't just immersed in the horror at this point, but it is in fact swallowing you. You forgot you were even in a haunted house, and since you're too far to turn back, it's about time we see the main attraction. Upon going down the final layer of hell, we can see a dark, dingy, decrepit set of hallways, completely devoid of colour other than the blue tin on the walls. However, the colour that will stand out the most most to not only your eyes, but will hit that fear factor in your brain immediately is the red blood smeared everywhere. It is hands down the brightest colour in this menacing maze of halls and extremely difficult to ignore. Can this much blood even fit in a human? This place is where you have to go to turn on the power, to get some light source, but it won't be enough. Whilst traversing around these treacherous hallways, you can not only begin to see more blood splattered around the place, but the rooms themselves contain many dark secrets waiting to be discovered. And for those with a keen eye and decent observation skills, can actually venture around these extremely ruined and tight halls and rooms to piece together just what has been happening here. One room in the lab is this one here. It has human bodies that have been used for experimentation and have been cut open to be tinkered with. There are also these body lockers full of more humans, but if you look at the one in the bottom right, you'll notice that there's one missing. The shattered glass nearby and that empty body locker has ketchup coming from it, which clearly tells me that the guy that was stood around here is one messy eater. So that's not actually what went down. Although we shouldn't rule it out entirely, it would seem as though one of these bodies that was stored wasn't as dead as someone thought. You'll also notice that around the lab there's cages everywhere, cages that look like they can fit an animal inside of them. In the power room there's more blood smeared around the place, but it looks as though there's some sort of secret entrance here that some scientists were trying to get to in order to be able to escape these zombies. You can see how desperate they were in their attempt, and I don't know if you noticed, but it looks like it failed. The last room of note here, the creepiest room in my opinion, is the pig room. In this suffocating space, there is a pig that is suspended by some rags. It's still alive, squealing constantly, with flies eating away at it. Judging by the state of the other rooms in this area, this pig was about to experience some horrific terror and honestly may have already experienced it. And I've always thought that the pig just has such a sad look in its eye. So you know, that doesn't help either. You can actually choose to put this pig out of its misery, but even if you do or don't, it's your conscious it will play on. You, the player, are contributing to this map's extremely sickening atmosphere, whether you end the pig or not. There's another pig on this surgical table that, well let's be honest, isn't getting up anytime soon. You got pork chops tonight. Love pork chops. And there's bigger cages next to it, with more pigs that I'm just gonna assume are sleeping. In this same room, if you go to the barrier and look out of bounds, you'll notice there's part of the floor dug up. Upon further inspection, you'll see these body bags, and then it will click. These bodies are the failed experiments. They're being hidden under the pentagon and buried away so they are never found again. You can even see the top of the body bag sticking out of the ground from where they've been buried. That's a 
pretty morbid thing to see outside of a barrier. Usually zombies so far surrounded you with horror. Five not only nails that, but in this one instance, it makes you add to it. If you leave the pig, it'll slowly die and suffer, and if you end the suffering, then you've just taken the life of an innocent creature. It's probably not that deep at all, but from a thematic standpoint, it makes some sense. With the encounter of this room and everything in it, it makes this map just a bit more darker. There's no reward for killing the pig or for leaving it, it's just about what you feel is the lesser of two evils. The cages around the halls that I mentioned earlier may not seem like much at first, but think about everything we've talked about and then those creepy crawly crawlers around the map. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, those guys are back by the way. Take the testing between humans and pigs, the Nova 6 crawlers themselves, and the pig-like noises that they make. And even the fact that they don't show up until you enter the lab area itself, it all comes together and implies that these tests were in fact to make the Nova 6 crawlers. And the cherry on top here being the amount of Nova 6 gas canisters that are clearly just stored in mass around the map. Transformation from the pig to these. Whether it was deliberate or not, maybe they're a failed experiment, it's terrifying to think about and without a doubt one of the scariest things on this map. Now that the power is on, we can see the teleporters open up to move us around the map and traverse around the layers of this hellscape better. But the rounds are ticking over fast and the place has gotten a lot darker all of a sudden. Your eyes are starting to dart around the narrow rooms and you can hear a really off-putting noise. It sounds digital and glitchy and you cannot for the life of you tell what the noise exactly is. Why are there no zombies spawning? There are no hellhounds spawning either, so what is it? There he is, the Pentagon Thief. He comes and snatches your weapon and runs away. You can get it back if you eliminate him, so you'd best hope that you have enough points for another weapon off the wall. The Pentagon Thief is freaky because of the atmosphere he creates. It's like being in a horror film. A good one, mind you. He looks quite unsettling too. He has these goggles that feel like they stare right into your soul, and his lab coat is just full of markings and scribbles. He is infamous for sneaking up on you. You know he's coming, you just don't know when, and I feel such suspense when this round starts. Hoping he doesn't sneak up on me and taking away one of my only means of defense in this already extremely difficult map. Five is one hell of a map. Literally. After looking into why this map used to freak me out and still retains its fear factor, I would say it mainly boils down to its difficulty and claustrophobia. You constantly feel like the map is getting tighter and tighter as you descend down through the pentagon, and like I said earlier, it feels like it's structured similar to that of a haunted house with what a thrill it delivers. A horrific, inhumane secret waiting at the bottom from what seems like such a normal office on the surface, albeit with a strange ghostly atmosphere to it. The Pentagon Thief is a beautiful finishing touch to this map, making the difficulty much harder and the stakes much higher. He is determined to cripple you by taking away your only means of defense, that being your weapons, and with the claustrophobic spaces and the small amount of health you have, it makes you feel like you are sinking into a ever-closing pit of hell. Ascension is a really weird one, and what I mean by that is that it doesn't jump out at you and make any scares it has remotely clear, but that does not mean there isn't a lot to appreciate with this one. Ascension blends its frights with the map, and that's why describing what is initially scary about our favourite Soviet base, unless you have another favourite Soviet base, that is, when compared to the rest of BO1's maps, it is hard to think of specifically one or two things, so I'm going to try my best with this one. I've got to be honest, I feel kind of obligated to talk about the loading screen music of Ascension because it just sounds so good. What makes it jump out to me and what makes it relevant to this video in particular is that it conveys this evil sci-fi type of theme, like something a character would hear as they're about to enter some sort of abandoned research facility that did some really twisted things, and that there's some sort of evil rabbit hole that you're about to venture down into. It just works really well, especially with the loading screen itself 
itself, which I've got to be honest, I could sit and analyze these things all day. But just to keep it brief, something that does stand out are the rockets that have shadows and those shadows spell out 115. Now, if that alongside with the music doesn't make that feel ominous, then I don't know what does. It's a very hidden little detail that by no means really needed to be there, yet it was added anyway. And I think it actually goes hand in hand with the illustrations and the music to show how 115 as a whole is a looming threat that is hiding in this facility. When you spawn in the map, you'll notice that it's dark. The colour then begins to fade, it's just black and white. How strange. You're landing into the map through a flying platform, literally being lowered into this desolate hell. A hell you can't even properly observe due to the black and white filter. And straight off the bat, the use of this filter seems to be present for emphasising the use of the power switch within the map. Once it's flipped, you have just brought not only power, but light and colour to this wasteland of a place. However, Ascension isn't the most vibrant map ever, and so whilst you would expect to see this incredible bright map, you get lots of dull colours, blood that's wet and dry and the place is still just as empty as you found it. Except for the freak sacks of course. This place has been overrun and abandoned, remember? The turning on of the power is a huge victory for the player, sure, but the huge facility far out from civilization, What difference did you really make? This one has a haunting start to it, with the disorienting grayscale not giving you enough detail as to what's going on around you, mixed with the freakishly empty room, devoid of any people but all of their equipment is still there, really does just make something feel off about the map. I don't know if this was just me, but when I played Ascension for the first few times, and even to this very day, I feel like I'm being watched every time in this spawn room. I don't know what it is about the map, I can't really describe this one, I feel like I'm being watched or monitored in some way. At the beginning, we hear the voice of a man, a man in distress, calling for help, saying he is trapped and to hurry because she is coming. The she is none other than the tragic and nightmare-inducing Samantha Maxis. She has been solidified as a loose cannon at this point, from the events of World at War back in Darice, and the fact that she sends undead hounds to eat you like all the time. This gives you and the boys a sense of urgency from the very start of the match. You know what I choose, Liz. Help me. She's coping. The mechanism must be repaired. I will help you, but only if you get me some vodka. Although Ascension's easter egg is short, it does a good job drilling in that feeling of urgency, making you a little creeped out by hearing how hopeless and scared Dr. Gersh actually is. The fact that Gersh says this to you pretty much as soon as you enter the map shows that he's clearly in desperate need of help, which really goes a long way to show just how powerful and feared Samantha has become amongst mere mortals like Dr. Gersh and the characters we play as. Now, back in the day when zombies came out in World at War, they would simply walk, run, and sprint toward your direction in a straight line, not being able to comprehend any sense of danger coming towards them as you finish stuffing another belt of bullets into your M1919 Browning, and then keep firing away at the undead as they keep rushing towards you in that straight line, diving in head first and getting really stuck in there to help paint the walls red. Now, that was the case for all zombies in World at War and early Black Ops 1 maps, that being Kino and Five, right up until the release of Ascension, and it only happens in Ascension, which is very odd. You'll be playing Ascension like you normally would, and then you'll go to shoot a zombie, and all of a sudden... Wait, did... did that zombie just dodge my shot? Yes. Yes, it did. Not only did this really throw me off guard when I first saw this, but this is a bit creepier when you think about how some of these zombies know how to evade your defences and seemingly have some sort of spatial awareness. Seems as though those glowing eyes aren't just for display. The zombies in this map aren't just mindlessly, literally, trying to kill you, they are actively strategizing and reacting to your actions, giving them a new layer of danger that you need to be vigilant of. Weirdly though, this has never returned in any other zombies maps. Which leads me to believe, whatever happened to these zombies, what Samantha may have done to them, or if they freshly 
actually been turned, they seem a cut above the rest. A fun little idea though is maybe they're like the virals in Dying Light, where they're survivors that have just been turned, so they still retain some of that human movement and likeness in the sense that they're more agile and more aware of what's happening around them. And I think for Ascension, that could make sense. Ascension uses its scale well to show not only how alone you are in such a once busy place, it also shows how stranded you are, and that there is no good way of escape, and the ways it actually presents this scale to you is what I appreciate so much about it. Whenever you think of Ascension, you picture the rocket right? It's the heart of the map and it towers over you, quite ominously too. Like all the scrap metal and machines are going to restrain you and topple onto you. With the amount of machinery and junk around the map, honestly, it gives me some Fallout vibes sometimes. I always found it striking when you took a trip on a Lunar Lander. Something that is needed in order to progress through the map and unlock Pack-a-Punch brings you into the air in this facility. And you would think that there must be a lot going on outside, but then you fly up and it's nothingness. For miles and miles, completely shrouded by darkness and fog, it looks genuinely post-apocalyptic like a Fallout game. Take that combined with all the metal junk around the place, you'd think that Good Springs or some shit is out there. Upon realising all of this when you're up in the sky, you're then lowered down back into the depths of this desolate hell, with this new perspective of the map in your mind. Both the inside and the outside of this map are eerily quiet, further adding to that wastelandish feel that Ascension seems to capture so well. The ambience is used in full effect, with nothing but wind blowing, minor electric sparks flying, and metal bending to immerse you in this nuclear fallout vibe. Combine this ambience with the desolate, rundown visuals, and this will look no different to a barren wasteland. The cosmic monkeys that you see that come and take your perks, which is so goddamn annoying by the way, is a stark reminder that much like Five, animals sadly were experimented on in the pursuit of twisted experiments and selfish people trying to reach their own selfish goals no matter what cost. Although the zombie monkeys don't feel very threatening, They just have a soulless look in their eye. It feels like there was never a living thing behind those red eyes. They come crashing down from space and they choose violence. These zombie monkeys aren't anything you need to be quivering in your boots because of. I feel more sorry for them than anything else. It's not exactly made clear what happened to the monkeys, unlike the pigs in 5, but all we know is it involves animal testing, 115, and being launched to space. Regardless of that, whatever they were launched up into space as, aren't the same things that crash down from space and want to beat up glowing machines. And the most extreme case of this animal testing on monkeys was none other than the guy himself, Cosmic Silverback. You know, the big funny zombie gorilla, yet yeah, that thing has been confirmed to have escaped from Ascension, so if there's things like Cosmic Silverback that exist, then uh, who knows what else they were doing here. And just in case Ascension didn't have enough weird stuff in it, I've got to talk about the teddy bears. Yes, Samantha's signature toys have made a return in Ascension, and in usual fashion, I'm sure you know the drill, by finding and interacting with all three of these, it'll play another classic Treyarch bop. A song! Let us dance! 
What's so weird about these teddy bears you ask and why am I mentioning them? Well it's the fact that this time they're not just sat on their own covered in blood, they are wielding a sickle, a signature weapon of this map and it's only a small detail. Them holding a sickle probably isn't that big a deal, but I can't lie they give off this threatening presence when you see them like that. They're stood around in places as if they're a bit more active than just laying around somewhere, like they chose to stand up, but this effect should sink in a bit harder now because we we know how dangerous Samantha is at this point, and the wrath that she's already bestowed upon poor Dr. Gersh. It's like the teddy bears are keeping a close eye on you, something which Doris did really well with that shadow of a teddy bear. It's like Samantha's in the background, always keeping tabs on you. Ascension is a dead, lonely place, both inside the map and out. Although Gersh is somewhat present, he's under attack and when everyone around you is either about to be killed by a little ghost girl or wants to rip you to shreds, you're just as lonely and in danger as Gersh. You're in a place where there was supposed to be progress in rocket science and if a whole facility of scientists and Russian soldiers were wiped out by the Horde, then you're next on the chopping block for sure. Just like many maps in these early days of zombies, you're stranded once again. Except this is a huge place, now completely empty and desolate. It gives you a sense of control by being able to restore light and colour to the facility, but it won't really fix much. The only help you have is in peril, which you have to rescue, and as you play through the map you realise how no one could ever find you, and just how tiny you are in what feels like a vast fallout. It's as if the facility's oversized machines are caving you in, trapping you there. Ascension does such a great job of tricking you into feeling like you're in some sort of barren, destroyed wasteland. Who knows what else is out there? The Siberian Tundra. What a cold place. Cold enough in fact that you could freeze to death. I found Call of the Dead to be quite a chilling map. For me, I think Call of the Dead stands out for the very unique way that it delivers its own unsettling theme. It's cold. Although loneliness is present in most maps from World at War to Black Ops 1, and certainly is still here in Call of the Dead, it's the coldness that's always stood out to me here and really always has. When you think about how the map is designed, you'll realise that the harsh weather conditions are designed to work directly against the player, or at least affect the way they traverse around the map. A good example of this is the infamous icy waters that connect to other parts of the map, parts that you have to traverse through to either get a around the map or be able to obtain items like perks and pack a punch. And if you're sluggish enough to stay in the water too long, you'll begin to freeze, a slow and painful death to have to go through. The water slows you down exponentially, and as the cold sets in, you're eventually completely debilitated, all the while the flesh feasters are coming for you. The thought of being this cold is overwhelming, in all honesty. I couldn't possibly imagine how cold it would actually be, and from time to time, this very thought would cross my mind when traversing the frosty waters in Call of the Dead. Having to work around or sometimes charge headfirst into the cold creates an interesting atmosphere and dynamic to the map that brings some hesitation when the zombies can trudge through the elements just fast enough to be able to swipe you and put you down below the waters. There's also the fog. A result of hardware limitations from Call of the Dead being so grand in scale, making it too demanding for the Xbox 360 and PS3 at the time, much like Transit, now acts as a harsh disadvantage in conjunction to the coldness. This one really is as simple as, the less you can see, the worse off you are. Games that are solely made around scaring players use vision to its advantage, and although the fog is accidental, seeing the zombies emerge from it, or worse, seeing George freaking Romero's glowing spotlight hammer sparking through the mist. I have a lot to say about George Romero on this map. Another way that the environment of the map works against you to create a more hectic and hopeless feeling is the star of the show himself, George Romero. Cut! Are you blind, man? Like this. 
I think it's more fitting to put Mr. Romero as more of a hazard in this map, like the weather conditions I've been talking about earlier, changing the way you play, making you feel very suffocated in a map where you can go pretty much anywhere in order to survive. This is because George doesn't feel or function like a normal zombie. He's a force to be reckoned with, a force of nature. Not too different from the unforgiving cold, George Romero wants to hunt you, slowly but surely, and makes you feel like you can't settle into a comfortable routine. The true wild card of Call of the Dead. Sure, he can be killed, but he will always come back. If you go too close to him, he'll strike you with his hammer, let out a loud roar, and begin charging after you. He can be calmed down when he strikes you with his hammer and chases you, but he can always be angered again. His ominous mumbling, laughs, and taunts always used to creep me out, especially when you didn't know exactly where he was at any given time in a match, which was in part due to that thick fog, working against you once again, but you could hear him calling for you. This can't be fun for you. Where are you? The idea of something that can't be killed and is always trying to get you will never stop trying and what feels like towers above you, this guy's tall, is quite scary. That's why George is so effective. He isn't just a zombie, he is part of the map's dangerous environment, only able to be calmed by that very environment. He is one with it. Much like the unrelenting cold, Romero has to be worked around and controlled for the whole time you're playing this map, from the very start of your game to the very bitter end. Something which can only be done for so long, and when it gets too much, you will suffer. I guess what I'm saying is, George Romero is simply <laughs> built different. Oh yeah, the zombies. The zombies in this map take a withered and frosted design, with their bodies taken over by the piercing cold, and some parts are completely gone. Like the zombies with no jaw that have presumably snapped off due to the icy climate and decay. They are hands down some of the scariest designs for zombies we've had in my opinion, and they always gave me the heebie-jeebies. Looking at the zombies is what feels like a solid reminder of the cold, being able to take hold of even those monsters monstrosities. As far as creepy details go in Call of the Dead, it's not exactly its strong point, but I will point out this. It's something that is unique to this map, so I really appreciate it for that. When you go near to where Mule Kick is, if you look in this container, you will see these. And if you're wondering what they are, good question. They appear to be these test subject holding containers where people would be strapped into it. And upon seeing it at first, you might not realize what they are until you stop for a minute and actually take a closer look at them. My best guess as to what was going on with these is that maybe live subjects, prisoners of war, or even zombies may have been transported over to Siberia via these test subject containers. They're another example of details that are placed in the game that make you go, what the fuck? But I've actually never noticed these. I, I always ran past them and just thought that they were some sort of electronics, and so realizing what they actually were, I ended up getting a lump in my throat. It's even more experimentation and inhumane practices going on, as these people were probably transported overseas to be further experimented with and contained. With all the Zeds considered, the weather, the desolate location, and the big scary guy with a spotlight hammer, Call of the Dead's cast of characters, played by real actors by the way, including George Romero, the director of the film that shares the same name of the map, Michael Rooker, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Robert England, and Danny Trejo, <laughs> let's be honest, probably aren't as fit to survive such unforgiving conditions as the four soldiers in World at War and Ultimus in Black Ops 1 are. Our four characters in this map were just here to act in a film, and <laughs> Romero was just there to direct it, and they got completely screwed over by the zombies. If Dempsey, Richtofen, Nikolai, and Takio managed to put an end to the zombies and fix the universe after dying and having to start over god knows how many times, what really really makes you think that a couple of actors would survive not only the brutal undead, but the unrelenting climate of Siberia in their way. 
Call of the Dead uses all of its cards when it comes to map design and setting. I always felt as though it was an overarching theme of the coldness. Other maps show you how bad Group 935 are and the zombies are, but this map combines the zombies with the looming threat of Mother Nature herself to show you how brutal they are as a duo. You're constantly having to push back against this nature. Call of the Dead ends up making zombies a management game just as much as it is a first person shooter game. You're having to learn to try and control the nature, but it can't be tamed. Not forever anyway. Even with the zombies out of the picture, if you are stranded out in the Siberian tundra, it's the bitter coldness that controls you. Much like our characters, fighting for their lives in this icy desert, with no good way out and as a result, they will most likely suffer a terrible, slow death, consumed by the cold. Imagine being teleported to ancient ruins deep in the Himalayas that is actually Mars, with zombies all around as you uncover a secret upon these mountains about British explorers stuck in time loops and a mystical rock which you need, all whilst zombie monkeys try and take things that aid you in your survival as you shoot the normal zombies with a gun that shrinks them into tiny little zombies. First off, well done for managing to cram all of that into your brain, and secondly, welcome to COD Zombies. It only gets weirder from here. Shangri-La gives exactly the experience I mentioned earlier. Ancient ruins, and lots of secrets to uncover. Before we get to what I feel is the best and scariest part of such an intriguing map, let's talk about the rest of it. This map makes you feel as though you are diving headfirst into a dark mystery that you're never gonna quite get the hang of and wrap your head around. One that'll keep your mind just as active as your character is in game. The way this mystery is even introduced is the loading screen. It's one of those images that makes me feel just as uneasy as it does make me feel intrigued. It emits the fear of the unknown sense on you. Seriously look at it, what is actually happening here? Ancient ruins? A freak storm? Oddly cut patterns in the grass? It's confusing and still to this day has its intrigue and a slight dread for sure. But the first first few times seeing this image not knowing the story of Shangri-La is definitely jarring. Although once the secrets of the map are spilled, the loading screen will hit a little different. Shangri-La takes place in the Himalayas, a setting radically different from the other four maps that we've had so far. This isn't an open area by any means, in fact it's one of the most narrow zombies maps to date and it gives the impression that you're really shrouded in this chaotic jungle. It uses the foliage to its fullest effect here, instead of having thick cold walls surrounding you, as is the standard procedure for zombies, most of the time you're blocked off via the dense jungle trees, bushes and branches. Ruins can be found which appear to be ancient, with strange patterns and architecture that gives off an alienating feeling whilst progressing through this place. And that's not even mentioning the zombies themselves. The Shangri-La zombies have some of the most interesting and unique zombie models that I've seen in Black Ops 1. They look really malnourished and covered in filth all whilst decaying. There's also weird tattoos on the zombies, and I have no idea what these are. It makes me feel like there's something bigger going on. They're victims of this jungle of chaos. Like many of the other maps on here, especially when I was a kid playing this one, again I felt really lost and isolated, and the foliage once again helps with this, which makes the map feel like some sort of maze, with all of the foliage I mentioned and the ruins. I also feel like I have to mention the underground section that is below the map. Shangri-La doesn't have these extremely hidden background details, instead it just lays it all out on the table for you to look at. The mines are filled with 115 meteors everywhere. It really reminds me of Shinonuma where the 115 meteor itself, the very cause of the zombies, is somewhere in the corner of your eye reminding you of the terror that it's inflicted. And in a certain room along with these 115 rocks, there's this slew of dead bodies and even these hogs which have this demonic look to them which I can't unsee. Also, the zombie containers 
from Kino de Toten are back in Shangri-La. Clearly whatever 935 were up to extends far beyond just their facilities in Germany and instead it seems like they're trying to hide a lot of things in Shangri-La. Although it seems like there was a 115 deposit here and a lot of people were mining away at it to be able to get more of the stuff. I don't really think I need to describe how sinister all of this is here together but the way it's all laid out and stuff is such a mess. It fits the crazy chaotic nature of the jungle itself, and with the amount of 115 it radiates that supernatural aura that the map has going for it. And I don't know, just the tunnels in general, how dark they are at the end, it feels like there's something down there about to jump out at me. It just makes me want to nope the hell out of there. Even when I was recording the shots of the tunnel and stuff, I got this really like panicked feeling, like this pit in my stomach. It was a really weird experience. As I was making my way through Shangri-La, I had the creeping suspicion that I was not meant to be here. A theme which I'm sure you've noticed all the way back from World at War to now. Like I found myself becoming entangled in a sadistic secret the more I started to realise what was going on here. And believe me, you really have to work to find out what this all means. And much like Darice from World at War, Shang's real kicker takes it from being a fairly ominous map to a zombies map fueled by otherworldly doom. So what is this mystery? Well, whilst finding radios around this map and doing the main easter egg quest, you learn of two British explorers named Brock and Gary. They fly over Shangri-La with an expedition crew and after learning about where Shangri-La is from some villagers who explained that it was on top of a mountain, Brock and Gary wasted no time to venture into the mossy jungle. Brock later reveals that his intent for coming here was to look for a gateway to Agatha in order to prove once and for all of its existence. And for those that don't know, Agatha is said to be this legendary kingdom, a utopia centred in the Earth's core. And it follows on from the Hollow Earth theory, which I recommend doing some research into, it is wild. The duo find Shangri-La, realising that this place was not abandoned. The heat and humidity is just excruciating. According to the locals, the temple should be in this mountain range just up this river. Gary, do you hear that? A waterfall. We must be close. Hand me the binoculars. There is a structure up ahead. If this is truly a gateway to Argatha, my work will finally be validated. Uh, Brock, I don't think this place is abandoned. Don't be silly. This place has to be thousands of years old. The duo are inspecting some shrines until, all of a sudden, a strange freak eclipse happens, as hordes of the undead begin to appear with the explorers in their sight, and start to chase them as Brock and Gary get the hell out of there. I have found some unfinished carvings around the structures I can't make out. They do not look like... Wait, what is this? Why is the sky dark? It's an eclipse. We must have... Run! What are those things? Zombies. We have to find another way. Zombies? What are you talking about? The writings must have been right. The... No! Don't touch that! Damn! Take a look around and try to find a way out. I got nothing. We will have to conserve our supplies. Take your shoes off and hand me your socks. They manage to get stuck in a temple on their escape, as Brock does a recording exclaiming that Gary has died, and along with the battery of his radio that is going to die too, Brock will follow. I have been trapped in the temple structure for days. Gary is dead, and I don't see a way out of here. I can still hear the zombies outside. I fear this is my last recording, as the battery is about to die, and I will soon follow. One thing I can be certain of is that blood. In the next radio, it would seem that they're actually alive somehow. They eventually stumble upon an altar with Richtofen wrote on it, as well as the Focusing Stone, a device which, if you're a zombie story veteran, you'll know what this is. And if you don't, it's basically a 115 meteor that needed to be shrunk down, and it's required for Richtofen's final plan in the Moon Easter Egg. Upon discovering the Focusing Stone, the two explorers interact with it. Although, after Brock touches the focus 
folks in stone, the strangest thing happens. I am now entering the antechamber. I see some sort of altar, and there is a rock suspended above it. This is just wonderful. An inscription. Rick Ta Fen. Rick Ta Fen. Gary, take an etching. The rock above the altar seems to be suspended in thin air. I'm going to remove it now. <laughs> Been in this jungle for days and haven't seen any sign of this hidden temple. I cannot give up. It has to be here. I can't shake this feeling like we're going in circles. We should get to higher ground and take a look. The heat and humidity is just excruciating. According to the locals, the temple should be in this mountain range just up this river. Gary, do you hear that? A waterfall. We must be close. Hand me the binoculars. There is a structure up ahead. If this is truly a gateway to Argatha, my work will finally be validated. So it would appear that through touching the focusing stone, Brock and Gary have been strung into a time loop in which every single time they die, they are then thrown back to when they first discovered the hellscape of Shangri-La, advancing through the jungle. During the easter egg of the map, you're trying to communicate with Brock and Gary, trying to help them in whatever way you can, but sadly, there is no way out for them. Even when the easter egg is complete, they aren't saved. And in other timelines, they can't ever catch a break or get any kind of happy ending. They will always be stuck there forever. And that's haunting. Shangri-La is terrifying to me once you learn about Brock and Gary. Not terrifying in a, wow, look how creepy that decaying zombie is kind of way, but more psychological than that. Imagine being stuck in a time loop with absolutely no way out, where you constantly die over and over, trying to cling to every bit of sanity that you have. Nothing ever moves forward. It's a personal hell where no one can hear you scream, but you will, over and over and over and over again. I really love the time loop stuff. It brings a certain level of nihilism that's enough to become chilling. It sheds light on how time loops can completely change a person's mind, change the way they are. Sometimes for the better, but most of the time for worse. It taps into a really interesting part of humans, and this is probably why I loved the games Deathloop and Hades, and why I love the anime ReZero, which really showcases the lasting effects of constantly dying over and over again. <laughs> Yes, it is I, Frederica. Ready? Look at those choppers! I, I promise you, it, it is good. It's genuinely hard to watch how much Subaru Natsuki suffers as the show goes on. But before this video becomes a ReZero analysis, let's get back to Brock and Gary. Much like the other media that I mentioned, Brock and Gary's story fits right in there, showing what going insane could be like. Except the thing is, they don't even really know they're in a loop. Not even remembering takes this to another completely different level. It would be like forgetting what you can't even remember in the first place, but I'm sure your brain would carry over the trauma of it and so you would just go insane without even knowing why. It filled me with dread and loops are a huge theme in zombies, but Shangri-La best displays how the time loop idea can be its own unbreakable infinite void. Aesthetics and other parts of the map aside, this is Shangri-La's card, a scary look into an unavoidable, unbreakable cycle of nothing but pain, confusion, and inescapable insanity. This is all wrapped up in a mystery that is seemingly otherworldly and would be extremely difficult to comprehend for anyone. So being stuck in a situation like this, not only suffering where no one can hear or see you, but there would be a lingering state of confusion that would never, ever go away. Shangri-La is many things, a deep ancient shrine filled with mystery, a ruined yet beautiful place, but most of all, Shangri-La is a tragedy. 
It presents a horrific story, one that you can't look away from. Brock and Gary's story is the showstopper entrenched in this map. It took the radio hunting that worked so well with Darice and how that told its story and implemented it with just as much finesse as Treyarch did back in World at War. It really is the darkest secret that lies in this jungle, and there is nothing you can do to save or reverse these explorers' pain. The Moon out of all the places you would expect a zombies map to take place, especially back in 2011, I think that the freaking moon would have been the last place people would have thought of. If there is anything that genuinely scares me shitless, it's space. Oh, the, the ocean is really up there too. Whenever I get into deep thought about space, I get a horrible feeling of existential dread. Like I'm having some sort of crisis when I actually start to realise how isolated you are from anything that is even remotely familiar. You aren't just far away, you are far away. And once a feeling like that sets in, your survival instincts will go wild. In this video and the Horrors of World at War video, I'm sure you may have noticed that although each map has its own unique themes and presents its own kind of horror, as different as they've all been, the one theme I think they've all shared is the sense of isolation. Moon takes that feeling and ups it to another world. When your game's loaded and you've spawned in on moon, you'll notice you're not on the moon at all. Instead, you've just spawned inside of Area 51. And there's Pack-a-Punch? Anyway, you notice that there's no sign of a round count, yet there's zombies emerging from the ground and coming in from all different sides of the area. Then a beep can be heard, and they begin sprinting at you. They aren't going down after one knife either, and they start spawning in mass, along with hellhounds. Another beep is heard, and even more begin to swarm in. And they're even stronger now. Realising there is no way out of here, other than getting game ended, there is a teleporter pad waiting to be used. Well, you escaped, but wherever it is you are, you can't breathe, you have to make a rush to a PES suit in order to get oxygen. Once you get your bearings, you realise that now you are on the moon, and it is all going downhill from here. When you scramble over to your PES suit and equip it, all the sound around you is completely drowned out. Not only does moon spook you, but it takes away your sense of hearing, one of your core fundamentals as a human being for survival, and it is suppressed heavily in pursuit of Richtofen's grand scheme. The zombie groans are extremely faint now, to the point where you won't hear them until you feel and hear that thud of your suit as a maggot sack swipes at you. You're caught off guard, unable to hear. Don't let that happen shortly after, or else Griffin Station will be your cold grave. Space doesn't have any sound as it is, so if you find yourself outside the station with no helmet on, you will hear the depths of nothingness that the ever-imposing vacuum of space ensures you wallow in. You see, there is no map ambience, no scary bangs, crashes or creaks to make you look around with concern. Moon makes its presence as a horrific map known by doing nothing with its ambience. It's just you, the zombies, and however far out you can gaze in the abyss of space leading to layers of isolation and paranoia creeping up on you. All you can hear when you remove your helmet outside is your character gasping for air with a dull yet oddly calming voice from your suit telling you to put your helmet back on because, I mean, to be fair, why would you take it off in the middle of space, you dummy? Lungs. With Griffin Station being located on the moon, this makes for a truly dangerous, drab, and ominous setting for a zombies map. And we can't ignore that it is one of the most ambitious too. So an example of realising how stranded and deserted you are on moon, and one I've always found scary, and you know I still do, is to head downstairs from the moon's starting room, and if you look out the map, you'll see nothingness. 
It is all space, an infinite void just waiting to suck you in. And I think that's the part where you realise you're completely stuck here. There actually is nobody here. At least on the other maps, you're on a planet where other people existed on, but here, on the moon? You're all by yourself. A phrase that carries much more weight behind it than it does for any other zombies map. Then that gut punch happens. That funny feeling, if you will. The, I really am screwed kind of thought pierces into you. That is what Moon does so well. This realisation of infinite loneliness makes your gut sink into the pits of the nether. It's as bleak as it is fascinating. And the closest I've seen a map achieve this other than Moon is none other than Nocturne Totem. It's like going full circle with both maps sharing the same theme of hopelessness and despair. In one map, you're still on Earth, just far away from any kind of help where no one can save you, and that way it has a more realistic feel to it. And the other, you're not even on Earth, and there is literally no way anyone can save you. It's a really unrealistic situation, yet they both deliver the same feeling. It's oddly poetic. The aesthetics of the map are, I would say, abandoned sci-fi. If anyone hasn't already made that up, then I have just now. Griffin Station is just as desolate as the surface of the moon itself, with its room filled with basic metal-plated flooring, accompanied by lots of terminals and computers, with little blinking, beeping and booping lights. The vibrant perk machines lit up around the map fit the visuals seamlessly, adding a cosmic layer to them just by gazing at them in this context. Yet, it's all so empty and gloomy looking at the same time. Now, obviously, Obviously, no one here is maintaining Griffin Station like they should be. It feels like something out of an intense galactic sci-fi, but a feeling of this place being long forgotten and the loneliness in the air grabs you by the balls. The colours are bright, but not vibrant. The rooms and tech are faded and washed out, playing to the abandoned feel of Griffin Station. It's almost as though the place is decaying, with the colours evaporating and withering. A certain area of moon that has always stood out to me is the Biodome. It's a really interesting room, and definitely heavy on the sci-fi. This large area is filled with rocks and foliage, a contrast to the wasteland of the moon. However, it carries a hollowness with it. When you realise how, I guess, out of place and artificial it seems, it's a dark area lit up with lights of the bounce pads, creating this dim, zombie-filled globe of sorts. It's like this really weird mood lighting. The Zeds can be seen emerging from the shadows, the bushes, and from behind behind the rocks as their beaming eyes are the first things you spot. It's crazy, to say the least, and manifests a jarring feeling in you. And despite it being so big, you can actually get caught off guard at any moment. If we're talking about POIs on this map, then I should probably have mentioned the moon pyramid device by now. A surreal metal obelisk type of structure that towers over you in the power room, with menacing evil radiating off of it. It is really hard to ignore, as it's very eye-catching and feels very out of place. The weird strange markings on it feel so odd that it ignites that fight or flight sense again, or at least it did for me. It taps into that fear of the unknown again, which is something that Black Ops 1 has done so well up to this point and is still delivering now. Once you look at the MPD, you can't really look away for some reason. Moon's aesthetics are up there with some of the scariest zombies maps to date. Maybe that's a controversial opinion, but it's one I hold near and dear to me. I'm gonna make the comparison to Noct again and say that it conveys so much whilst not showing so much. Okay, I don't think I need to explain any further about how alone you must feel on a place like the frickin' moon, nor how deep and vast the infinite void we call space actually is. So let's talk about Griffin Station's inhabitants. First off, the zombies' designs in this map are interesting. You can really see how pale they are from presumably being on the moon for some time, decaying and wasting away, but also from how painfully cold space is. They look like they've suffered from having no oxygen oxygen for their withered bodies. Their veins seem to stick out, deoxygenated, a blue colour which is a morbid contrast to their bitterly cold, pale skin. The zombie models in not only Moon, but Black Ops 1 as a whole, are so detailed in the way that they show off the effects of the environment taking a toll on these decaying bodies. From the bloody trench coats of the massacre at the Pentagon in 5, to the iced over flesh of the zombies that are present in Siberia, aka Call of the Dead. Moon shows the shriveled, deoxygenated bodies that are stone cold from skin, or lack thereof, to bone. 
There is also another zombie, one which we can't actually see. Or should I say we can see it, but not underneath what it's wearing. I am of course referring to our jump scaring, perk stealing, and forever exploding zombie astronaut. <laughs> This guy. The astronaut is one of those things that used to make me leap out of my socks, and I think a big reason for that is the classic yet forever effective use of your mind imagining a monster. An evil you don't want to think about, but can't do anything but that. All we see is a strangely limp body inside of this lifeless spacesuit. It's uncanny for sure. It slowly but surely waddles its way over to you, with loose enough movements to be a zombie, but not as sporadic as the normal zombies we see in Black Ops 1. It's oddly calm and collected, not too dissimilar from George Romero, but unlike him taunting you from across the map, the astronaut is a silent predator. He's easy to outrun, but once you lose sight of him, you have no good way of knowing where he is until a round or two later you're on your way to get a perk and then... He grabs you, pulls you in, and gives you a good old bash with his noggin. This puts you to extremely low health, and teleports you to a random spot around the map, leaving you vulnerable and confused with one less perk to help you. All it's gonna take is one hit from a zombie to connect with you whilst you're getting your bearings back, and that is it. You, you are, are done. done. You can get rid of the astronaut quite easily, but it will always be back. Also, much like George Romero there. And when it does come back, it'll be ready to slowly chip away at you. Perk by perk. Rest assured, the amount of jump scares I've had from this guy that made my ass clench hard enough to grip a golf ball is seriously countless. They aren't even cheap FNAF jump scares either, they're earned. The suspension ramps up as the minutes tick by where you haven't seen the cosmic perk collector. He is anywhere and everywhere, so you'll need to think twice about walking through those doorways. The Moon Man brings a feeling of something like the film It Follows, in the sense of no matter where you hide or how far you run in Griffin Station, hell, even the whole moon, it would always know exactly where you are. By, I'm guessing, the powers of some sort of supernatural insight, and will continue to be hopping towards you. It doesn't need to rush, because at some point, it'll get you. Gordon will reach you. Now anyone who played Moon at some point must have wondered, what are we doing here? Completing Richtofen's grand scheme is what we're doing. The easter egg leads you through the usual zombie stuff, until you get back to the MPD and flip that switch. And up she rises. Samantha Maxis. The very same girl that we heard the tragic cries of as her world changed forever in the Reese back in World at War. The girl who lost those dearest to her. The girl that swore to kill them. Kill them all. Okay, so how did she even get here? She actually stumbled into the MPD herself when her and her dad, Ludwig Maxis, were trapped in the Darius teleporter. Maxis ended up game-ending himself and Samantha wound up at the moon, where she then got spooked and got herself trapped in the MPD. She was corrupted under the influence of the Dark Aether from this ancient device. And that was the moment Samantha Maxis became an angel of death. She now had the omnipotent powers we've known from the previous maps and take the corruption from the dark ether, then mix in the dead daddy issues from earlier, and now all she can feel is rage. That's when she sent zombies to overrun the scientists at Griffin Station. So all of the bloodstains you see in this map are all Samantha's doing. Okay, now you've released her and she's towering above you, holding her teddy bear calling card, which I'm sure you know by now, holds a lot of weight and significance throughout zombies. Her and Richtofen end up switching souls, with Richtofen taking control of the zombies as a result. And Samantha's quotes to the zombies from Richtofen's body show how far gone she is at that point. Time to play with dead things! Oh, little one! Playtime is over! Once Richtofen takes the reins for the Zeds, all their eyes turn blue, showing the shift in power and he even becomes the announcer, something which at this point has only ever been Samantha. This and everything that happens in Moon also sets up the events of Black Ops 2 zombies. At the end of the easter egg, rockets are launched and they shoot directly towards Earth. <laughs> 
All you can do is sit back and watch the place you called home, the place you needed to go back to, be completely shattered as the rockets explode. Fragments of the world float around after the huge cracks through it begin to disperse. What was once a natural green and blue planet has now took on the form of a fiery hellscape of a molten rock that you do not want to find yourself on anymore. Your world really has shattered before your eyes and now you have to sit with that. That silence of the moon moon, of space, of the void, throws out its arms to make sure you can't escape it, and that deep feeling of dread, once again, really sinks in more. The impact of that silence hits harder now. The game doesn't end either, and nothing much really happens to take your mind away from your actions. The world has just been annihilated by you, and now you have to sit with it. Moon launches itself across the horoscope, combining themes of crippling loneliness and debilitating dread, not too far off from something like Nakda and Toten, except it ramps up the feeling of isolation to its extreme on a more cosmic scale. You're witnessing the thick atmosphere of the void and the small blip that Griffin Station is in it. That place feels just as lonely as the moon itself, so seeing that presented in the abandoned sci-fi theme I mentioned earlier is really interesting to me. The tragic tale of Samantha and Maxis from Darice weaves its way into this too, which is a nice touch. The dread dawns upon you fast once the earth is blown to smithereens and the constant nothingness keeps your mind focused on it. Space and the universe goes on as if nothing happened. And there you are, now in a worse situation than you started in. All by yourself. Okay, now after all of that, although Black Ops 1 Zombies may not be as terrifying as World at War is, I do think that it does stand on the shoulders of the type of pants-shitting experience that game set for zombies. BO1 did a phenomenal job at making me, and many others it seems, scared. Whether that be to the point where you had to shut off your console, or maybe even just a little shudder down your spine. It showed many horrors of not just the zombies, but the places they inhabit, and therefore emphasises the danger that you're in. Which is really similar to World at War, and you can 100% tell that Treyarch was simply picking up where they left off when it comes to displaying undead terror and twisted scenarios depicting true evil, albeit slightly more. All of these maps and their executions just show how rich the scares really are, with each individual one feeling like a different thrill, which is also like World at War. Black Ops 1 also managed to break up some of the tension with some funny one-liners and quotes from characters, which, although all Ultimus were in two World at War maps, it felt like the comedy and the dialogue ramped up way more in the following Zombies title. And I don't think it makes the experience any less scary, if anything it's a nice bonus about these gems. World at War and Black Ops 1 Zombies provides a constant slew of scares, and these themes clearly weren't just some afterthought here. Treyarch went balls to the wall. Kino de Toten displays the decay and ugliness of a hollow, abandoned place, one which you feel like you shouldn't be snooping around in. A complete ghost town. Five, quite literally, lowers you in a more claustrophobic and worse experience as the map goes on, with a cryptic menace that takes away your only means of defence, leaving you vulnerable before you even got set up, all whilst uncovering how the sausage is made with the Nova Crawlers. Ascension takes away the only help you could have and dangles it right in front of you, showing you a bigger threat with Samantha and Gersh, and the map feels like a barren, apocalyptic wasteland. Call of the Dead delivers its horrors by using the environment to great effect. If the zombies don't kill you, the scathing cold will, making even the zombies feel like a force of nature. Shangri-La presents a spiralling mystery that if you're entangled up in, you'll never be able to escape from, displaying a tragic story where you can't look away. And finally, Moon, a bleak, desolate void filled with an ominous atmosphere and an evil secret, all leading up to existential galactic dread.
And I also wanted to say thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for still being here. No matter how much I say it, I can't express enough how much I actually mean that. I know it probably sounds generic, but I really just wanted to say that. The support that you've all shown towards me and the channel, it's been more than I ever bargained for. And so if you're here still, if you've enjoyed the video, then I want to say it again, thank you. Also, happy Halloween, if the video is even up by then. It's supposed to be, so we'll see what happens. My Horrors of World at War video was a year ago on Halloween, so much like I did with the icebergs, why not come full circle? So well done, Treyarch. You scared the shit out of me and many others. Again. With everything at the forefront, it's truly hard to escape the twisted horrors of Black Ops 1 zombies.